And we're live. Welcome back to another episode of Corona Geek here on Google Plus, where we talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. I'm your host Charles McKeever, and we're we're kind of a small crew here today, aren't we? Yeah. yeah what's yeah. up on that? Yeah, I don't know. I tweeted everything out and Facebooked it and all that stuff like that. I think it's the uh, after Labor Day week. Yeah, uh, I think syndrome. everybody's recovering. <laughs> Maybe so. All right, well, joining us here today is Ed Marina, uh, programmer extraordinaire over at roaminggamer.com. Thanks for joining us, Ed. I was also, to show the forehead there, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Google Google has implemented HD uh, Hangout stuff here, so now if you click that button, your whole perspective goes wonky. And well, Yeah, and, and, and then Ed ha happens to have capabilities on his webcam that I do not, so he can zoom in on his hairline. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us is Greg Pugh from GP Animations. Greg is a, uh, what are you, Greg, a... Uh, Multi-talented renaissance, renaissance guy. I guess I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Flash developer, app developer, guy. Graphics extraordinaire. Yeah. Yeah, but you do you do a lot of programming as well too, right? You don't like it, you, <laughs> but you do it. Yeah, I program. I, I like it. It's like a nice. Uh, it's a nice mix-up because I'll draw some and I'll get bored of drawing. Then I'll program and I'll get sick of programming when I run into a bug and then I'll draw again. So it's nice to have two different skill sets because I get bored easily. You so you're a left a left brain right brain kind of guy. Yeah. That's yeah, a that's good cool. Sign, getting bored easily. You got a <laughs> brain that's just trying to you know stay busy. Exactly. Exactly. I'm, I like to tell my kids my brain is hungry. It's always hungry. <laughs> it's like the hungry, hungry hippos. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> that's hard to do. That's hard to, that's hard to communicate on a webcam. Uh, all right. Yeah, let, on that note, let's move into some uh, some other stuff here. Let's see. So what what what's going on over at Roaming Gamer? Anything Besides exciting? Secret stuff. Yeah, I'm totally yeah. flat footed there. Uh, oh man, that was something. Something's going on here. I, I knew that you had put out some uh, tutorials and stuff, and the, uh, uh, there was a last time we had talked about the poker template. Is there anything yes. new like that? Any so, kind of? Uh, I've got no new templates. You know, I'm going to have to disappoint you. I don't think I have anything publicly um, available yet this week. Okay, but next week what we are going to talk about, though, right, is we're yes. going to talk about SK, SSK Corona. Yes, we might even talk about SSK in it, instead of SKS or. SK, SSK? Yes, we're going to have a discussion about SSK where we're going to dive into, um, well, dive into the details. We'll see how that show turns out. I've yeah, so that's, yeah it's, a third, it's a third party, for those who don't know what we're talking about, that's a third party library that uh, Ed created to help making games be uh, easier, I guess, is, if that's not grammatically yeah, correct. It's, it's, a, work. Least. it's a work saving library that I'm proud of. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I know a lot of people had, had uh, jumped in from the previous show and said that they would love to have a, an in-depth uh, walkthrough of that and how it works and all that kind of stuff like that. So that's coming up next week, so be sure to watch for that. Uh, also, let's see, Jen Looper in Boston is getting ready to present at the Boston Festival of Indies. So if you're interested in that, if you're in the Boston area, uh, go to bostonfig.com and... I think there may be tickets left, so go check that out and see if, if you're in the area and you go stop by Jen's talk and uh, say hi. She's going to be presenting on, uh, of course, how to use Corona, but she's also going to be showing a, a uh, Candy Crush type clone. I think we're, which we're trying to internally, we're trying to call it uh, Corona Crush. So, uh, so that's kind of fun. And of course, Ed, Ed, is the, the 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 genius behind the code on that one and the um, genius. The genius. Aura here. <laughs> genius genius <laughs> you're supposed to you're just supposed to do this when you genius right. if I don't know uh, you were gonna say that I would have had some stuff going on here yeah yeah and 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 of course Greg did the, the graphics for that as well so you guys are both uh you both both involved in that oh nice monocle I yes. like it the genius, genius. <laughs> Of course, are you trying to say that Mr. Peanut was a, was a genius? Because that's what I always think about. Oh, 
Was it the devil horns or the cat in the hat? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> nice bozo effect. That's pretty good. I would try. I would try to do that on this end, but it'd probably blow something up. <laughs> uh, oh, nice. Okay. Well, you, well, you guys have uh, fun with the Google effects. So I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Uh, this weekend, I actually I I reviewed a couple of apps, a few apps that I, that I want to mention uh, briefly. One of them is called. It's a waterfall app and. That's going to be coming out shortly. Uh, it's got some great special effects in it and, uh, and things like that, but it's, it's really a collection of waterfall images uh, from Nick Nabowski. And he actually, well, he didn't take the images, I don't think, but he put the app together from a collection of images. And then he took certain pieces of the, of the photography and separated it. And then move he moves things around, and it has a great special effect. I mean, it's really really kind of cool. So uh, that's going to be coming out soon, and, and uh, we'll we'll let you know when it's available. But uh, I had a lot of fun with that. And then also I took a look at uh, Copper Shield, uh, which is actually out in the iTunes Store. So if you get a chance, go play with Copper Shield. It's kind of a a space shooter type game, um, and uh, I had a lot of fun with that. It's uh, got a little D-pad on it. You can move around. I, I told uh, the developer, uh, I, I told Jason, I said, you know, the enemies are real are a real pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's a good compliment to any game when you can come back and tell them, you know, their enemies were, were really hard. And so that was a, that was a lot of fun. So if you get a chance, go check out Copper Shield. And then uh, also the other one that I that I was working with. Um, uh, was I, I, Greg? Tell me the it's a uh, word. What was the word? The What's that? No, not phrase game. Not a phrase game, but word games. Oh, okay. Yeah, the word game pack, and uh, you know, by you and our regular. Um, my brain has gone completely blank. Oh, Daniel, that was, uh, Daniel Williams did that on his own, the board game pack, the uh, 7 yeah. games, the one or whatever. Oh, you didn't do the graphics with that? Uh, no, I was working on another project when he was doing that. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, okay. So Daniel came out with a word game pack, and that's it's got, what, like seven different word games in it, uh, which are actually very interesting. Here's here's one that I like, for, uh, that I thought was really good for, for Halloween, is, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's uh, Zombie Hangman. And, uh, you know, which could get a little gruesome, right? Because they're zombies, and you would think that when you hang them that their heads would actually fall off. And, uh, nice. But they don't. Yeah, nice. Exactly. I thought, this is, what I, this is what my brain goes through before I actually play the game. I'm like, ooh. Uh, I'm seeing but, spurting blood. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 <laughs> well, so what happens is, here, I'll just do it this way. What happens is uh, the zombie's there, and as you get wrong letters, he gets closer. So if you get it wrong, which hopefully I will, playing the game backwards, yeah. um, eventually, you know, he he captures you or whatever, right? He, you've been attacked by the zombie. So it's kind of a different way of playing um, Hangman, I thought. Sure. You know, because the, the typical, right? Because we we, al oh. we always I always take a game concept and think that I have to do it that way because that's the way it's. I mean, Hangman is Hangman. But that's not the case. He, he he had a creative spin on it. I thought that was cool. Yeah. So where'd you get? How'd you how'd you learn about this? Uh, well, Daniel sent me uh, a message and said, "Hey, you know, go go check this out if you would please." Uh, and Jason sent that to me through for Copper Shield. He sent it through me to me through Facebook. And Nick is a Corona ambassador, and he sent that to me through e email. So are you gonna link these up? If in you the have show notes? an app or something you want me to look at. Yeah, I'll link up in the show notes, and so if you have an app or something that you want me to review or talk about on the show, send it to me, and uh, I'll take a look. Roger. Okay. Now. Okay. All right, well, let's move on to Steve Ballmer. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, we are going to talk about Steve Ballmer real quick. I want to get your guys' opinion on that, but today we're going to look at uh, buoyancy. We're going to walk through some code uh, and show how to make things look like they're floating in water, but... But real quick, I just want to talk for a few minutes about the Steve Ballmer thing and the Microsoft buys Nokia thing and get your guys' thoughts on this if you have any at all. This is a surprise topic. It's a pop <clears> quiz. 
<laughs> Did you know? You know what I'm talking about, Ed? Your your eyes are furled. For, for for, for no, for I've old? got no idea. I've been so heads down. I'm so so Steve Steve yeah exactly. I know that I'm the same way. The only reason I know about this is because I listened to Twit and uh, they were talking about it over there. So Steve Ballmer was going to retire. He announced his retirement. Uh, he says, you know, I'm gonna uh, in the next year or so I'm going to retire. And I I kind of caught that go breezing by on Twitter or Facebook or something, right? And uh, I thought, oh okay, he's gonna retire retire. He's been there like thirty something years 34 years or whatever he mean you know Steve Ballmer was um, was uh, college roommates with um, that, that Microsoft guy Bill Gates and you not the, 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 the not Steve Jobs guy you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The not Steve Jobs guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that should be a clip right there. The not Steve Jobs guy. Yep. And then you should, uh, you should, you should have butt that with the section before. Uh, Bill Gates. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, they they've been together a long time. Um, you know, kind of like the Rolling Stones, and you never think they were going to break up, but apparently, uh, Balmer announced his retirement, and uh, and then. I guess like a week later or something, um, he's out. So uh, I, I don't understand what was happening, and I think it's kind of caused a little scuttle butt in the tech community, and people aren't really sure what's happening. A lot of people think – some people think it's because of the board kicked him out, and some people think that he was just ready to go. Uh, but I think it's interesting that at the same time, Microsoft is buying Nokia. Did you see that, that news article? I, I dropped off for a second there. Sorry. Did you see that? Yeah. Did you see that? No. Microsoft bought Nokia. That was the question. No. Didn't see that either. Yeah. Head in the sand weekend. Okay. Well, I don't know what happened with the weekend. But anyway. So so yes. Yeah, so Microsoft has purchased Nokia. Uh, so what do you guys think about that? What do you think that's going to mean for Windows phones? <clears throat> Which is Nokia Mobile, though, right? Yeah. No. Well, Nokia Mobile. Yeah. 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 Not the galoshes and the, and the stuff like that. <laughs> Microsoft's not, <laughs> Microsoft's not getting into... To, Who to knows it. what they're willing to do at this point. Wearable micro, yeah, wearable Windows. <laughs> wearable tech. <laughs> wearable right. tech. Windows on your big toe. That's right. They'll tell you how much uh, water you're standing in. Yeah, are you standing in it? Of course you are using Windows. Right. Are you standing yeah. in the, sh uh, the water? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's you this time, okay. not me. So, so what we well, think? anyway... Yeah. So, what do you guys think? Is it? I think it's it going to. I don't know. I didn't really <laughs> care because I don't think Nokia and Windows have made any like crazy improvements within the past couple of years. So, I don't know. I actually stopped. I used to love Windows and everything about it, and then you know I got in the Mac, and that was the end of that. So, <laughs> you, you broke up with it. <laughs> yeah. After all the problems, all the blue screens, that was the end of it. I'm only laughing not at you, but at Ed's response over there, where he's like the single holdout, you know. <clears throat> oh yeah, because he's all. Whatever you say, I say the opposite. So say <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, brother. Yeah, that's right. No, no see, Ed, 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 Ed lives in both camps. Yeah, I have to unfortunately live in all camps, which just that's gives right. me a well headache uh, sometimes. What's what's the thoughts on Ubuntu and and them getting into the mobile phone business and the TV thought, business and every business well, all at the same time? I, I thought that I'd was say dead. That's dead. Is yeah. it dead? Did the Kickstarter work? No, I don't think the Kickstarter work uh, worked for the Edge product, but they the definitely released the million dollar uh, Edge product. They released everything else. I mean, you know. They had the Indiegogo, and I think I think they got like twelve million or something like that, maybe more. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, they they ramped it up right at the end there, but they didn't get as far as they needed. They didn't reach the goal. They didn't get any money for it. Yeah, they don't reach the goal. It's dead. Oh. Yeah, here, it's, there's the there's the link to the Indiegogo uh, article, and, or not article, but the well Indiegogo Edge. campaign. Um, oh yeah. yeah. So they their, their goal was bit, like thirteen million. Yeah. Well, their goal was thirty-two million. Yeah. And they almost raised thirteen million. So I, I, I think that this is 
Uh, okay, here's an interesting side note. We're not really – I wasn't planning on talking about that, but here's an interesting side note. I think when you set a really, really high goal, then it's hard to reach it, right, unless – Unless your really high goal is just like like if you said I need thirty two thousand dollars to make this project work, mm -hmm. and you set your goal at fifteen or fifty thirty two thousand thirty two million thirty two million to make it work, you set your goal at fifteen million right, which is I don't know how much how many nickels and dimes you have laying around your desk drawer, but that's a lot of that's a lot of money right, yeah. and for most people, so you blow through let's say you blow through that though on and go to the thirty two. Well, now it looks like you, you met and surpassed your goal. But if you set it at $32 million to begin with, well, good grief, man. I mean, that's, well, a, that's an all-or-nothing proposition. They had to set it that high because you know they had to meet a minimum funding for manufacturing. That's, and, that's like a Google mentality of uh, Android. Mm -hmm. you know? KitKat is the fastest-growing installation set. Yeah, you and 10 people. You know, it is the fastest-growing segment of Android, but it's just because it's the only segment we've had in three years. Uh, on the Ubuntu page, though, they do still have the phone OS. So regardless of them actually making their own phone, the question is, since they're trying to partner with carriers, this easy-to-use, supposedly, you know, I don't think it's a Qbill or HTML5, is that going to be, like, a thing that gets going? Or it's like, would it just take somebody like a Verizon to go, hey, sure, you know what I mean? So I, don't, I so I'm, I'm lost on that part. What are you talking about? So so what are we, what are we saying? Look, there's you look there's at the... the well, it's I look at the market space. Like Windows Phone is like, I'm not. I don't even take any time with that. Just like I just ignored BlackBerry, it was pointless. But they have a market place already in place for the Ubuntu desktop. And although it may be a small market, they're looking to aggressively put the phone out there. And it doesn't have to be the Ubuntu Edge phone you're talking about. It can be any phone that wants to run this software, right? It's right. still Ubuntu. They already have a tablet. They're looking at a TV. And it all runs part of the same app ecosystem because it's all Ubuntu underneath. But don't you think that's but don't you think that's part of the conversation though? Re when the reason they wanted to come up with their own phone was so that they could ensure that people would run their OS, which is the same reason that Microsoft is buying Nokia, um, because they they need to ensure that somebody will run Windows. Yeah. Well, okay. So do we think that Nokia is they're certainly going to put Windows on those devices? Well, they already have. I mean, they've they got have. the Nokia, oh, the well, Nokia phone. Yeah, and I don't know what I don't know part of the details for the conversation. Oh, well, you know, there's, oh, there's new ads right now with that Nokia phone with the 42 megapixel camera. You know, and anyone any anyone out there that's a fellow camera head knows that anything over 10 megapixel is not really all that needed if you're just even if you're blowing it up to the size of a wall. So it's just like overkill. But it's yeah. it's something they can brag to, right? So it takes up half the back of the phone as like one big, one big CCD area for the phone. That's what I need. Yeah. Well, here, here, here. Just to speak to speak to Ed's point here is in this Verge article. I put the link in the chat and to this this Verge article. At the at the very end, it's, it says uh, for seven point two billion dollars, which is what Microsoft's buying them for. For seven point two billion dollars, Microsoft bought its way into the category of device and services company. It gives Microsoft the kind of end-to-end -end control in mobile that only Apple and BlackBerry have enjoyed to varying success, and a critical measure of quality control. But can Microsoft succeed where Nokia failed? Was Nokia holding Windows Phone back, or was Windows Phone the problem? <laughs> Sorry. So. I mean, so they yeah, the Lumia and all those other devices and stuff, you know, they're all they're Windows phones. But I, I don't know. Well, I, 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 question I, is, is Corona going to start going to Windows? I'm going to say no. <laughs> I, I think I think the main issue, right? So you have the the Edge, right? It's yeah. a seven hundred dollar phone, and that only really targets like the developers because the developers are used to buying phones off contract, right? So it's kind of a small market and also it's kind of like the programming market too. So how many consumers are really, really going to want to buy that phone? Then you think of like the Windows phone and like Nokia and like the 42 megapixel camera or whatever. There wasn't much app support, you know, and they kind of got to the, the whole phone market late, late, you know, iPhone already came out. And then Android was very came out very close to the iPhone, and then Windows Phone kind of came out like three years after the fact. So 
already Android and iPhone had this huge ecosystem of apps mm -hmm. and user support. And then Windows came out late, and then there was n no one had any allegiance to Windows. Well, I think here's, that's he, he, part of the issue. Here, here, here's, here's the reason that Microsoft's having a hard time. And uh, if you look at the space, Microsoft was actually we, – we, we, I, know, I know what you're saying um, for them being late, but, it, but if, you look, if you go back and look, they were actually early because they were pocket PC back in the day. And you had Windows, but they, but they were following the Windows model of being a, of having to hit the start menu and then having a drop down, and it was the it was the drop down model and not the touch model, right? And um, and so what's really crazy is that Microsoft's been in the mobile space for a, a really long time, yeah. longer than iPhones and Android and all that kind and of stuff like that. So they should they should own they should own completely own the, the mobile space. But but the technology they, improved though, right? The data oh, yeah, connectivity, yeah. the 3G, oh, yeah. all that. And then all of a sudden, wasn't iPhone, if, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't iPhone like the first phone to support like 3G data connectivity? Or well, that's no? what I, that's, yeah, that, that's, but that's what I'm saying is they, they've, they've had the opportunity to be there all along, right? They're just now buying Nokia sure. and becoming a phone manufacturer, you know, sort of thing. Um, they've had the opportunity to be there all along, but they've always wanted to be just a software company, uh, and that's kind of relegated them to a place where they, they haven't been able to dictate any kind of anything, which when Apple came along and created the iPhone, they said, look, we're going to, you know, this is, this is how the phone, this is how the phone experience is going to be, and that's going to include 3G, and that's going to include, you know, it's going to be, this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be touch. It's going to be this big screen, and, and the Pocket PC was like this keyboard and this postage side stamp, you know, um, screen, yeah, and I remember then, that. you know, all that stuff. So it was like, I, I don't know. It, it, they've been, I guess what I'm trying to say is they've been there the whole time. It's just, they've, it, they haven't been able to get it together. And, and it was marketed to the wrong people. It was marketed to only business oriented people, right? It wasn't right. really marketed to the consumer where yeah. the iPhone was like, everyone can use it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, yeah, there was, there was. I mean, there's factors. You're right. There's technology factors that, that were in play. But, but yeah, Microsoft has been there. They've they've been in that space for a long time, and they, the the fact that they haven't been able to get it together, um, is telling. You know, it's very telling. So, uh, I would say, okay. So the other the other tidbit before we move on is that um, when Steve Ballmer started out as CEO of the company. The company, and, I, and I'm picking this again from a different. Uh, I think that maybe that same article that I put in the chat or a different one. Uh, when it started out, he was the market valuation of the company was like 669 billion dollars. I mean, something something crazy, right? And now it's like 229 billion dollars or something something like that, right? So, you know, so unfortunately, this is how this is how you know. Steve is being uh, Steve. Yeah, Steve Ballmer is being uh, measured right now. Is, is you know the, all these conversations about what he was his CEO, um, you know how well he did as a CEO. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't know. It, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully he'll be remembered for being one of the one of the early guys in Microsoft who helped build a, an entire industry. So I don't know. Some interesting stuff. So you get a, you get a chance. Go check that out. And go read it. It's uh, it's it's a, almost a footnote in history, computer history. But I'm kind of one of those uh, computer tech history geeks. So I, I I went to see the Steve Jobs movie. You know, the Jobs movie, even though it was really a, a, a Cliff Notes version of the story, just because I think that kind of stuff is interesting. So if you was do it. Pick that out. Yeah, it's all right. I mean, I'd wait for it to come out on Netflix. It, okay. it, it, it's let, let's just say it's entertaining. If you're into the that that genre of you know what's what what uh, what went on in, in the early days of computer tech, you'll you'll be interested in it. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, I keep wanting to say Wild, Wild um, No Wild, Wiley, Wiley. but that's not him. <laughs> Ashton Kutcher. Ashton Kutcher. Oh. Yeah. Which is a terrible name. Um, he he uh, he does a good job, I think. I think he did a good job, but the writers need to be would have should have been fired. Well, I, again, I, mean, I think it's it's the Cliff Notes a, version. Yeah, wasn't there a weird part though, like with 
you know, it's like I'm do, I'm not gonna do the custody thing with the kid. Which everybody's heard that story with the Lisa thing. Well, see, and, that's then, the... and then like thirty or forty minutes into the movie, she shows up on his couch, and it's like ten years <laughs> late. And, you know, and she's like in college, and she sleeps. She's sleeping over, and it's like, oh, just get up for breakfast. I'm like, where the hell did all the middle go? Where yeah, where they reconciled? It was like, I don't want you. And oh, hey, good morning. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> to, to, some, to some degree, no, uh, the, issues. Pirates of Silicon Valley, I don't know if you ever saw Silicon. that. What? Silicon? Oh, that's a, that's a whole that's different, a different show. film. That's a different that's all, You get that at the back of the video. That's the beyond our rating film. <laughs> if you've ever seen that, it's uh, it's actually a better a better rendition of the story, at least the publicly uh, released version of the story, uh, than... Than Jobs was, but of course Jobs was focused completely on Jobs, right? So I don't know. It was a good movie. If you're if you're kind of like me, I'm tired of being mugged at the the movie theater. Just wait for it on Netflix. It'll it it won't it'll be there soon, you know. Anyway, okay. So that's not why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> we're here to review code. Uh, so let's look at today's code sample. We're going to talk about. How to make things look like they're they are floating in water? Okay, and hold on, I'm gonna do the screen share, and I've actually I think I've actually worked this out to where I'm gonna do. Oh, hold on, let me move this over. I'm gonna do a desktop share where I share the whole thing. Hmm. Be, oh, well, look at this. What's the matter? Hold on. I don't know. Hold on, I'm having desktop. There you go. Desktop, desktop two. And the reason for that is because if you if you shared just, wow look at that that's awesome if you shared oh. just a wow did it did that's it trippy. Did go away yeah if you shared just the 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 simulator then every time the simulator refreshes the screen sharing goes off yeah, yeah you yeah. lose it you lose it so I figure if I just share the entire desktop and then move the code around and get the hold on so just give me a bear with me. I'm gonna move the simulator over there. I'm gonna move the code around a little bit, and then hopefully get us all in view, and then we can make we can make changes. Because I know Ed's got a gazillion changes he wants to make. So this is a sample code that uh, Corona made. No, no, no. Okay, so thanks, thanks for for that for setting me up there. Um, no, this is this actually comes from Adam. At uh, insert code or insert oh, okay. yeah insert code dot co dot uk which is actually I think if you go to his website now it's um, it's i n s e r t c o dot mm -hmm. d e right so insert code with a dot d e domain um, and it was down for a while the, the website was down for a while uh, and apparently the the domain name had expired and there was all kind of yeah. other things going on right and so this the, so the code kind of fell out of circulation, but it's uh, but the website's back up now. So if you go to the website, it's uh, it's all there. This example is there as well. So um, so I, I, I talked with Adam this weekend, and he said um, he's going to be putting up some and and things like that. Go there and check it out. I'm going to put that link in the chat. The other thing is uh, Ed has posted this. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, thanks, Ed. So uh, the other thing is, Ed and put that in the chat. The other thing is, Ed's posted this on um, GitHub, GitHub, which we will put that link in the show notes as well, and and share that out because it has a couple of different examples, a couple of different variations. So okay, so let's walk through this though, uh, and, and see how this is all there. So basically, this and it got a little MIT license, so you can kind of use the code as as you see fit. Uh, and so, okay, so right, starting at the top here, the very first thing that we do, and, and Ed, jump in if you have anything to say here, because I know you've reviewed the code and made notes. Uh, uh, but basically, okay, so as as per standard here, we kind of get rid of the, the display, the, the status bar, because it's, it's ugly and we don't need it most of the time. Uh, and then we bring in our physics. I'm, sc I'm scrolling around here between two or three screens. Hold on. Uh, Lost my cursor. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Comple I completely lost my cursor. I don't know where it went. I think my I think my mouse mouse might have died. Um, 
Okay, so we bring in our physics engine and start it up, and then we set gravity for the entire world uh, because we 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 don't want it just to just default gravity. We want to actually set it, and I I think this is basically we're setting it to pull everything down, uh, not just I mean you can pull everything up with gravity, but here he's he's actually set a very specific gravity. I didn't 40. play with that. Did, yeah, I didn't play with that. Did you play? Did anybody play it should with that? be nine point eight. That's like the default, I think. For yeah, that's the, that's the default, but he's. Okay, we'll play with that a little more later. But he's he's kind of gravity, and I, I I've got a, yeah. See there, see, see how it kind of, everything kind of falls in. It's all it's the the frame yeah. the frame rate's a little wonky here on Google Plus. But uh, if I set it to increase the gravity, everything kind of. Let's see if we do that again. Uh, hold on. Let's do that. Hold on. Let's do that again. My mouse went dead right here, right here in the middle of the show. Awesome. Uh, let's refresh. There it doesn't is. seem to have. It doesn't have. It seems to have too much di difference. What'd you put in that? Uh, I put nine. I put ninety on there. I guess that's maybe not a, not a different. Uh, that's a little well, bit of a difference. Definitely different. Yeah. So whenever th things fall into the water, they either fall in deep or they fall in shallow. Let's let's just say that. So based on that gravity that that he's set. So, okay. So that's uh. That's enough about that. <laughs> and, and then the other thing that that uh, they does is it goes in, goes goes in and he he gets the gravity for the x and the y, um, which we'll look at in a little bit here. Comes and he sets a, f a few forward references. So these are variables that he's going to work with at some point, but he wants to go ahead and define. I like the defining everything in one place. I like the way this is done. You know, kind of putting it all here. That way I can come back later and say, okay, well, I need to. If I need to add another variable, I go back up to the top of my code and I add it as a forward reference and I use it later. So uh, sometimes that's for reasons like you're going to need it uh, in advance, and sometimes I think it's just for cleanliness. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I do that too. You, you do that? You kind of group all your variables up the top? Yeah, like uh, the display dot content with, like all that. It just saves you so much time. Yeah, it's easier to you know. I know you can do search and replace and find you know find your variables and stuff, but it's, sometimes it's just easier just to scroll back up to the top of the screen and just you know add a new variable or find a find a variable if you need it or whatever. I don't know. I like it. Keeps everything organized. Okay, so uh, but what he's doing here, yeah. So he's grabbing the the, the screen width and height. Um, he's also setting up some four variables for our boundaries, which we're going to have. Uh, you know, we've got to keep our water on the screen and our blocks on the screen. And then he's got a liquid level, which I don't remember what that does, but he goes ahead and declares that here. Uh, he sets up his density for the, the liquid, the number of boxes. And these are all variables, so they can go back and change them later. So if you wanted to have, like, you know, 10 boxes, you could. So I think that's a good idea, you know, of course, always to set your variables uh, someplace and change them. That way you don't have to go th picking through your code to make updates. Uh, and then he's got the number of uh, the box size, so each box could be, you know, each box could be bigger, right? So now we could have just bigger boxes. Um, I just, uh, Charles, I wanted to talk to the uh, the gravity thing for a sec. Okay, yeah, go back to that. Where where at? Okay, so before you get into it, you're gonna you'll probably see it when you're doing the code here, but unless I'm I'm pretty sure I'm correct here. So the way this this uh, demo works is um, Box 2D doesn't like objects with bodies that are colliding to interpenetrate. So okay. I think I don't even know what that, I don't even know what that means. Uh, wow. So overlap. It doesn't want them to overlap. Oh, overlap. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, and so by adding, uh, raising the gravity, basically all it does is overcome the natural tendency of the uh, object to uh, to uh, attempt to stop overlapping. So you're talking about right here? Yeah, so you get, when you raise your gravity to like 100, you get a lot higher penetration when you drop the blocks. Oh, if you drop it to 100. Yeah. You raise it to 100. Raise okay. it to 100. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to see here. Smaller too, but okay. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll let you continue. Sorry. No, that's okay. Let's see here. I, I, yeah, I got you. So let's let's make the blocks. It may be hard to see, but let's see. Oh yeah, it's definitely it's gonna be hard to see. Okay, but the idea there is what you're saying is that we want, we want to keep the blocks separate from. I get. 
I get it. Okay, so let's go back to this. What was our block size? 40. Okay. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump it up. I don't know how it's going to affect the overall thing, but uh, let's, let's bump it up. It makes it, it makes it easy to see. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't come through well on the, uh, on the Google uh, Plus because it doesn't record at a high enough frame rate to see it. Yeah, 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 exactly. When, when you download the code for this, you'll see that it, everything, even the, uh, what probably doesn't even show up is the fact that it's bobbing. All the auto objects in the water are actually bobbing. Yeah, you can just and, barely see that. Yeah, let's see. Let's bump it. I'll tell you what I'll do, too, is uh, let's just increase the size of the simulator. Whoa. There we go. And sing. You're going to sing, too? Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you, you, you got to have uh, sound effects for all these tutorials. You, uh... Oh. Okay, can you kind of see that? It's kind of like little ice cubes to kind of dancing in the water. Yeah, yeah, we, I can see it. Okay. Well, that's, that's all that's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we set our boundaries. Uh, I don't know what happens. I didn't try to... I, you know, as I was picking this code apart, I didn't try to take the boundaries out. Does anybody know what happens if they take out the boundaries? Does the water run off the... <laughs> you know, I, didn't, I didn't play with this demo nearly as much as the next one because um, the next implementation of this was so uh, sexy to me. And I yeah. mean that in a, the code was like, wow, why, did, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, we know what you mean, sicko. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> an interesting day. <laughs> Anyway, so we set we set a ground and we set a ceiling and we set a left and right wall, which is you know pretty standard. Anytime that you don't want your, I think mainly it, ha it, c it comes from the fact we don't want our boxes falling off the edge, right? I mean, we could make these boxes big enough they'd actually crowd each other out and push each other off the off the stage and fall off the edge. So we don't we don't want that. Uh, and then we set them all to static, so that again uh, they won't be bouncing around necessarily, or you know they won't fall off the stage, they'll just be there. Okay, so so we do that, and then we create this uh, group. So we create a boxes group with, we're going to put each of our boxes into, and so now we've got kind of our, our, our main stage, and then we've got this boxes group on the screen, which we can't see it, but we're going to add boxes to it. So in our, box, our add box function, we're going to add boxes to our boxes group, which is fairly confusing. But uh, but what we do is we okay so we we create that add box function first because in the next few lines here 95 to 98 we're actually going to use it so what we do is we flip through and we create boxes that go into those groups so essentially whatever whatever our variable was I think we said five boxes right we are going to flip through five times and we're going to add boxes to our group. Nice. And uh, so we're going to create a uh, new rec. So we're just going to create uh, some basic geometric shapes. In this case, we're going to create some squares and uh, pass in our, you know, our box size and, and uh, that sort of thing. And we're going to go in and create uh, five different boxes and stick them into this group. So we, we randomly set the X so that they don't all kind of appear in the same place. And and then we create the we set the area, the density, and the mass for that box, which is actually just uh, is 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 area density and mass is that actually a, a property of new rector? Is that something that we're just creating on the fly? Does anybody remember? I didn't I didn't research that part. Hold on, I don't remember. Okay, Ed's, Ed's looking it up. So anyway, we're going to set those because we are going to use those later on. Um, in our in our calculations, but but Ed's going to look up whether or not that's part of the new rect or whether or not we're just I think we're just setting them as actually this is I think what I spoke to a week or two ago, which is um, about a year ago, Box Two D's implementation in Corona. I don't know about worldwide, but in Corona did not have a mass attribute, and so uh, you know it was probably out there, but. Uh, the key is is uh, if you wanted to do calculations where you applied a force to an object and you wanted to be consistent across different sizes, you had to figure out your own masses so you could do the appropriate calculation to apply the proper force. Uh, so what he's doing here it looks like uh, an adaption to an older version of Corona where he did not have a mass um, 
value because today Box2D implement, implemented in Corona does have a mass attribute. Okay. So long, long story short, this is something he probably did to overcome something that did not exist previously. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, we use those calculations later on, so they are important. Uh, and then he sets he randomly sets the fill color on them, so they just show up as different colors. And then he adds a um, physics, you know, it creates a, adds a physics body to each one of these so that they'll interact with each other. Which I don't know if we showed this before, but you can actually pick these guys up and spin them around, and you can stack them on top of each other, and they they kind of interact with each other. It's a little weird because I made, the, I made the boxes really big, but they see they won't, just like an, a real physical world object, they won't stay balanced on top of each other. They kind of float, float apart. But we flip through and we do that each time. So we've add box has been flipped through five times. And so we've added five boxes to our boxes group. And then, and then he comes in and creates a liquid. So, you know, this isn't really boxes in water. This is just sort of a... A special effect, right? We're kind of fudging it. So, so he creates again another new rect, which is our background here, our little blue uh, water type background. Sets the fill color on it, kind of gives it a translucency with the alpha, and and then sets the reference point to top center, the top center reference point, which is essentially going to be our water line, right up here across the top, um, and then makes it to where it takes the the height and width and kind of splits it and says, okay, we're going to do half the screen here. You know, our water water's going to fill half the screen. And that's really it. I mean, it's, again, it's just kind of a special effect, right? Hey, Charles? Uh, yeah. I need to redact the statement here, CI. He did not even use the, uh, the body premise on this one. So, okay. again, Box2D doesn't like to have two bodies that overlap. Uh -huh. He didn't use that. He's actually using an enter frame uh, method where every frame, each box, each of the boxes you've got there, the five boxes, is checking against where it currently is, and if it's yeah. below the top of the water level, it applies a force. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, we'll get to that in just a second. Yeah. Exactly. So my okay. mistake on that one. I'm sorry. It's a little bit different from the next example. Okay. Let me let me let me zoom out a little bit here. So. We... What was that? <laughs> okay. We got crickets. Okay, not, that's not bugs in our code. That's just crickets. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the drag body. So we're going to apply a uh, an effect or a touch a touch event for each one of these boxes. So he goes ahead and defines that function first because down here in 137 through 140, we're going to use the code, right? So we're going to flip through boxes, which is again is our our group. For however many items are in the in the boxes um, group, we're going to flip through that number of times, right? So we've got we put five boxes into the boxes group, so that means there's there's five uh, children of that group, and then what we're going to do is we're going to flip through, we're going to add an event listener, a touch event listener, uh, to each one of those boxes, and it's going to do that with the drag body function. So if we go back up to look at what the drag body function does, it passes in this um, variable is a you know the event whatever 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 happened um, whatever was touched uh, rather uh, that's passing in as an event and then we're going to go ahead and grab that out and say okay well what which object was touched as part of that event uh, and so we're going to find that find that using the the event target uh, what phase is that in so we're going to say you know am I touching am I moving or or have I released the object so we're gonna we're gonna figure that out, and then the other thing that's interesting here is it's it's actually figuring out where it is on the stage, uh, and I actually had to I go look this up to figure out you know exactly what it was doing. But but essentially when you start up your project, your the blank canvas, if you will, the blank screen there is just sort of your current stage. It's the default stage, and then when you put things on it and do touch events, you have to figure out where. Where those objects are, right? Because they're not just on the stage; they're in a group that's on the stage. Um, so, by getting the stage, getting the current stage, you're able to figure out where things are and, and, and how to interact with them. That's, I think, that's the, probably the best way I could describe it. Unless you have a different way of, of explaining it. 
I have no words of wisdom for you. Okay. Okay. So that's 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 basically it. You are reaching into. I like to think of it as we're reaching into the this to the group, and we are touching one of the boxes in the group, and we're and Corona knows that we're doing that because we do this get current stage, and then we use it later on. Um, so when our on our began phase, we've just touched the object. We're going to set the focus to that stage. Okay, we're going to set the focus to that bo the body within the stage, and we're um, and and then we're going to create a a joint, a physics joint. Um, and we're actually going to create a touch joint. Let me go over here and get my note. I got I have a note on this. Hold on, because if you look at if you look at the documentation. It says the Corona Docs. It says that the touch joints. You know, the touch joint is based on the Box 2D mouse joint, and it connects a single object to the current position of an on-screen touch. So basically, anywhere that you've touched, you can set uh, you can set a joint for that that specific area. So like if I if I grab it up here in the corner. Uh, the right-hand corner of this box. That's where I've touched that object. So hey, Charles, rather than you can, you can demonstrate this a little better by turning on hybrid rendering mode. Okay, yeah, that's okay. That's a good idea. Um, Go yeah, so it, it, if we don't have that, let's see here, physics uh, dot mode mode right. Set, set draw set. mode. And then it, pass it, it to string hybrid. No, no. Hybrid. Oh. Hybrid. Yep. Uh, lowercase hybrid. Oh. There's it's, it's helping you out too much. I know it. Now do your dragging thing, and you should see a little dragging, um, a little is line it, from where you drag. Is it it? Okay. Reload your app and show us the dragging. No. It doesn't look like it turned it. No. Up. Go ahead. Well. Hmm. That's strange. It doesn't look like. Uh, go ahead and give it a try, anyways. What do you mean? You just click on one of the boxes and drag. Why is it okay. not coming on? Uh, I don't know. Oh, I see. Uh, no, I don't see it. Thought maybe he'd spelled something wrong. I don't know if he's gonna get the draw point, but he's he is getting the actual hybrid mode because you see the outline of the square is a little better because it's actually showing how the physics is applied to the square. That's huh. weird because it works for me. Okay, well, that's well, all right. Of course it does. Course it does. <laughs> that's okay. I've, got, I've probably got something um, wonky there. But let's just go. Let's just keep going. Uh, okay, yeah. So the the, the main point, like, if if I grab down here in the left bottom left corner of this box and pick it up, my my joint is see it's right there. Oh, you can almost see it if you drag it real quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's there. It's there. It's it's actually just attached to wherever I put my mouse on that right. box, right? As opposed to like if I picked it up right smack, you know, if I picked up the box without this, it'd be like I'd just picking the box up and moving it up and down. I can move it, but here, I mean, it's it's a it's attached to wherever whatever point in that object that I click or touch. Okay, so if it so if interacts or is affected by um, physics according to that. Okay, so it gives it kind of the ragdoll effect almost, without actually creating all the joints for a ragdoll. Um, so that's, what, that's when it began. When it when it moves, um, it's actually just reassigning the coordinates for that for that joint. So wherever that moves, wherever I've touched it and move it around, it's it's uh, you know it's moving that joint that touch joint around, so that everything kind of stays. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't see it here. Basically, it's creating a temporary joint where one end is attached to the box, and the other end is to your cursor, and so it tries to follow your cursor around. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then on the ended, we're basically we've we've stopped touching it, we've let go of it. Now we need to uh, down here at the bottom, we need to set the the body to nil. We need to set you know remove focus from the um, from the stage and from the object. We need to remove the the Touch joint because you know to free up resources and stuff like that. We need to and we need to set it to nil. So every time that we, every time that we touch an object, we're going through these three phases. Okay. 
And so that that allows us to that's simply just to allow us to drag the objects around on the screen. We, we wouldn't we didn't have to, we don't have to do that. If you don't want to touch the, uh, drag the objects for some reason, you could just leave this part out. But that's an it's an interesting you know it's a nice example of that function. Okay, functionality. Um, so let's let me see here. This is so net, the, so the real beauty of all this was where the magic happens is in float. Uh, and let me actually get rid of these comments here just so that we can crunch because what happens in like you were saying Ed this is all happening if we scroll down to the bottom this is all happening on an inner frame so every 30 frames a second or 60 frames a second whatever we've got it um, configured for it's going to call the float function and basically adjust the boxes so what's really happening is the boxes are being pulled down initially by gravity, and then they're being pushed up and pulled down over and over and over again, which simulates this effect that makes them look like they're floating in water or floating in a, in a liquid. Um, so what, the first thing that we do on our float, again, this is being called every 30 frames a second or 60 frames a second, however we have it configured, is that we, we flip through the group, which is the, the boxes group, we find out how many objects it has in it, and then we, we go through and we look at each one of those boxes, and we say, okay, for this box, I want to set the, the Y. Um, let's see, what is it doing here? If uh, Okay, yeah, it's applying the forces to the box, right? So it's saying, mm -hmm. is, is, my, is my location of my box greater than or equal to basically kind of like my water line? Right, and if it is, uh, then it's coming in here and it's doing some calculations. So in the beginning, it's saying, okay, our our submerged percent, how much we're we're going to be submerged, is uh, is calculated. And then the next thing he does is he sets a default and says, okay, I don't ever want you to be more than 100% submerged, right? Because that doesn't make any any sense. You can't be more than 100% of something. So he goes ahead and sets a default for that, just in case. And then he comes in and says, okay, if that submerged is greater than 40, so this is just an arbitrary number, right? This is just anything, like he said, okay, I want like 40% of the box to be submerged. Um, if it checks for that, and if it is, if it's greater than 40%, then it's going to push the box up a little bit, right? Because the box, if I, put, if I go over here and pull the box down, now the box is like, let's say like 2 or 3, 5% maybe submerged. If I let it go, then the code's going to push it back up. Mm -hmm. If I raise it above the waterline, it's now 0% submerged, right? It's not submerged at all. Then the, then the code's going to pull it down. So, so essentially what we're doing is we're saying if the submerged percent is greater than 40, then we're going to apply... Um, which he's creating as a buoyancy force here. So he's looking at the mass of the the, uh, the box uh, times the gravity. Remember, we got the the gravity up at the at the top, and then we're going to apply some force to that. So we're 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 essentially calculating what, how much force we're going to apply to the box, and then we're applying that force to the box here. So we're pushing it up. Uh, let me see. Go back over. Note about that as well. The uh, apply force. So, so on the apply force, you've got a couple of different variables going on. The first two uh, things here are the x and the y of the force itself, and this next two are the, um, the the body x and y, where the where the where you want to apply the force to. So, uh, essentially, we're we're calculating this y value here. Of how much we want to push the box up. Right. The key point is that they're pushing up. It's the code is pushing directly in the center of the box and only upward. Yeah. So I could, if I wanted to, I could come in here and say 60% of the box. Right. So now the box is, um, if you look at it, the box is actually sunk lower in the water line. Right. Because now it's, it's uh, more submerged than before. So it's really easy to go in and, and just play with this. So if I wanted it to be like 20, now the box would sort of sit on top of the water, almost. So it, it would really depend on what you're trying to do as to how you want it to, to, to react. 
And the next thing it does here is it does some line dampening and some angular dampening, which I thought was interesting uh, because if you don't do if you don't do linear, I'm sorry, lin I said line dampening. If you don't do linear dampening, um, it's it has a pretty interesting effect. Hold on, let me yeah. let me take this back down to uh, like 80 for the box size. It's a good size. Yeah, and. Then let's go back down to linear dampening. So right now, when when the when the boxes fall, they fall into the water and they bounce, they jiggle around a little bit, and they kind of come to rest, right? And then and then they're just kind of bobbing up and down like they're in water. But if you take and uh, set the linear dampening to say zero and save, then the box is like they bounce up and down for which is here. Let me let's do one. They fly out of the water. Yeah, they actually fly. Like there you go. See those two on the left? They're actually flying out of the water, and they just keep doing that. It's almost like there's no because again they're not, is they're not actually in water, so there's no real friction. Right. So they just kind of it's almost like a perpetual motion machine. They just keep going up and down, up and down, up and down because there's nothing to um, diminish that. Well, you you said the key word there. Linear damping is. In an essence, in essence, like air friction on yeah. the body. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, yeah. And uh, the other part of that was the angular dampening. So, uh, so let's let's take the let's take the linear dampening back. And then, if you notice, when I take these guys and and move them around, actually, let's take this back to uh, let's take this back to forty percent. When I move these guys around, if I if I drag if I grab a hold of one of these guys and kind of drag him, see how he he doesn't really spin. Like as soon as I let go of him, it's like it it's almost like it the water has drag on it, so it doesn't it doesn't free float. I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. If I go in and on the angular dampening and set that to zero, though, now there's like no friction. So so the boxes will just continually spin. Yeah, it looks wrong. It looks wrong. Yeah, it's cool. So, yeah. so as I was going through this, I was like, well, these are some. I mean, as you play with this, it's it's a really a water buoyancy um, example, but you could you could manipulate it to get any kind of effect that you want. So you could really have some fun with this. I mean, because these are squares, but you could. They could be characters. They could be anything, right? So yeah. anyway, I think so it's a, a key takeaway for people here who are listening. Besides the just fun playing with this example, is playing with physics attributes can easily lead you to a game mechanic. Yeah, very well said. Definitely. Um, okay, so then, then then the other part of this, like I said, is it's, it's pushing up. So right, or pushing down. So if uh, so if our Let's let's say you know for for example our submerged percent was then then we're going to do this push down. So if we're if we're if our object is bobbing up in the water too far, then we're going to want to push it down. So that's that's basically it. Mm -hmm. um, and so okay, so let's move. I want to move. I want to show this other example. Yeah, yeah. We better show the other one with the. Uh, I know. Yeah. Let me see this. Uh, hold on. I have it here. So the other, so that's the first example. This next example, I think, is uh, I think it was Matthew Webster, who is a Corona ambassador. I think he he came up with this. Uh, ver and we're not going to walk through the code, but we want to do want to talk about some of the key points. Yeah. Do you? I can talk to it if you want. Sure. Go ahead. All right. So uh, unlike the last example, where there was a single body representing the water. Uh, and in, and in that example, we basically measured where the block was and applied a force if it got below that point. In this case, each of the little dots is a physics body. But instead of having it uh, collide with the big box and have a response, what they've done is set each of these bodies to, a, to be a sensor. So basically in Corona, actually box 2D, if two bodies collide, but one of the bodies is a sensor, then the colliding bodies are allowed to pass through each other without any physical response. 
the beauty of this example is what the author has done is said, okay, I've got two bodies colliding. One of them is a sensor. And every time a sensor um, sees that it's got a collision, it applies a little tiny bit of force to the block that collided with it. So in other words, the big block, like the one you've got bobbing there, is bobbing up and down, and it's hitting all these little tiny bodies that you can see, the little blocks. And every block that it hits applies a little tiny bit of force pushing the block back up a little bit. And a slight difference here is, is in the last example, the, um, the force was applied at the very center of the floating block. That's not true in this case. Each of the little blocks says, where am I, and applies a, a force at that very position on the big block. So a little bit on the right, a little bit on the left, a little bit on the bottom, which is what gives you this uh, nice uh, sort of floating and drifting uh, effect. Yeah, could you restart your restart your simulator? And then you can almost see the dots. Yeah, when you look at the code in the in real time, you or the simulator in real time, you can actually see the dots turn different colors. Yeah, unfortunately, it's harder to see with the. Uh, yeah, but when yeah. you're, we'll we'll put a link in the show description so people can go and download the code and and play yeah. with it. Although, you know, you could easily modify this code to actually change the color of the blocks to show you which ones have got a collision going. Yeah, I was, I was actually, yeah, I was playing with that before we got... Uh, Another thing you could do call. is to see the effect of the application of force is you could modify this, all the codes available on GitHub. For anybody listening, you should take this code just to see what it does and modify the algorithm, the loop that creates these little blocks and use like math random and say math random one to five and every time it's equal to a three don't make the block so what you'll get is like this weird uh, sea of blocks where there's gaps and then when the block falls down it'll be real clear when there is and is not a force being applied oh cool yeah because it'll act really strange it won't look right anymore but you'll it'll bring out the essence of you got I got forces being applied over here, but no force on the other side. Now you you put um, several variations of the code out there on GitHub. Is that yeah, is, does one of them have that? Explanation on that. So this one on GitHub is called Buoyancy Two. Okay. Uh, but one small flaw in this uh, example is it was written to work with 30 frames a second gotcha. explicitly, uh, which is cool, but. Um, with the physics in Box 2D, you always have to be consider how often you're applying force uh, per second because if you set the frame rate up to 60, the demo fails and the the uh, basically what happens is the block sinks to the bottom of the water. Um, okay. So example 2.1 out on GitHub shows that and how that works, and then uh, example three adds some code to fix that. So regardless of what the actual frame rate is. It always has a consistent behavior. Gotcha. Well, I, I was playing with this code, a little, uh, uh, the code, the actual simulator, uh, before we got on the call. And I don't know if you noticed, but, but just, just to kind of further illustrate the fact that these sensors are, are interacting with the block, if you create a block, because you can just touch and grab on the screen there, if you create a block in between the sensors and let it go, it'll yep. fall all the way down. Because it's yeah. not actually floating. Yeah, but if not it until it hits something. But if it touches one of them, man, it goes it goes nuts. Look at it. Woo! Yeah. That, ex that exactly demonstrates what's going on. It's no interaction until it actually hits one of those little blocks, which is applying a force to it. <laughs> which I just thought was I was like this is this is really fun. I mean, this makes yeah, you just want to play with it. The last example was great, but I love the ingenuity of this because you can use this. Great, it's water. We get the idea, but you can use this mechanic of a sensor colliding, applying a force with all kinds of game ideas. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this, is, this, this, is, this is the, I like this is the uh, exploding butter, is what I call it. I can, I can imagine having like a shooting game, like a tunnel flyer, <laughs> where you've got force fields in some places that push on your ship and things like that. Or fans, you could use this to create a, 
a fake fan effect that blows things up as they go by? <laughs> I'm laughing because because you're a uh, you 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 totally into the physics thing of it, and all I see is exploding butter. <laughs> yeah, you're exploding butter over there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And let's let's show the last one. Let, let's show that one last one before we 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 leave. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, so oh, I apologize. But we found uh, that on the last show, I think. I know, but I, I know, but I kind of want to show it again. It was kind of it's so cool. Uh, yeah. So here's the ripple one. So it it looks like it's falling into water and then and then causing ripples. So this is another one that I want to be sure to post a link to on the, the show notes because I'm not sure what, what I would use it for. I mean, you know, at the moment, but it's definitely a nice little piece of code that you'd want to hang on to. And then, as you demonstrated last time, you can grab the screen and you can create like a like a, almost like a like a, like a, like a almost like a uh, music, you know, sound wave type effect there, or whatever. So, again, I'm not sure exactly what the what you would use that for at this at the moment, but it's cool. Yeah, it's yeah, I I love these these examples. Yeah, and and I think it, just to for anybody who didn't see the last week's show, I think you said that each one of those lines across the top, each one of those points rather across the top, is being calculated on the fly. So mm -hmm. so so that's how it gets its uh its relationship from one dot to the next. So it's calculating its relationship on either side. Which, I, which is very cool. A lot, real nerdy and very cool. <laughs> yes, nerdy. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Not geeky, nerdy. Geeky. Well, well, geek is chic. <laughs> nerdy is just real. Uh, all right, so let's let's turn off the, the screen sharing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm including one more version. I'll uh, check it out on GitHub. Okay. Put, put it on GitHub, but it does this. Basically, what I was talking about, it randomly does not create some of the sensors, so you get this like patchy behavior. Yeah. And you can play with it to see how having sensors does or does not affect the force. See, like the force is no longer even, so every time it hits a group, that edge goes up. It's a little yeah. bit hard to see in the demo here, but I think people will get it. And it's not, and it look, doesn't look like it's enough to keep the block from falling. Yeah, also it's not enough because. Yes, this example is extremely sensitive to the amount of force, which is each little dot has to apply just its own part. Oh, we forgot to mention that. Multiple calls to apply force in Corona slash uh, Box2D is additive. So every frame, if you call it 100 times, all those forces... So let's say I apply force 1 and I call it 100 times per frame. That's the same as applying force 100 just one time. Which is that why this cool. example works. Right, and that could be very cool. I mean, well, it is very cool. We just saw an example of it. All right. So, looks like we went over a little bit. We did. Okay. So let's let's uh, announce this week's T-shirt winner, and then we will close things up. So this week's is it's uh, Joel Candelaria, and I hope that's pronounced that jo or correctly, Joel. But uh, Joel uh, heard about us on the Corona Labs website and follows us on Google. And uh, he went over to coronageek.com slash giveaway and entered his name in the drawing so that uh, he would potentially win a T-shirt. And so now he's going to have a T-shirt sent to him along with a free year subscription of App Developer Magazine. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, T-shirts are your thing, which I personally have just a closet full of T-shirts. Uh, go on over to coronageek.com slash giveaway and fill out the form there and tell us how you – heard about Corona Geek and where you follow us on social media, and hopefully we'll choose your name out of the hat. <laughs> Way too much fun with it. Hold on. I want to do this. Hold on. Uh, now The show's over. You can leave now. Okay. Well, go Google Effects. I'm going to – downloading the app, opening Google Effects. It's probably going to blow something up. Yeah, see now it doesn't. It won't do it for. There it okay, now it's, it's coming in slowly. Oh. All right. Arr. Arr. No, that oh, look, it's too slow. Can I? Oh. Can you just? Arr. Ah. It's not working for me. No, for some reason, that, Google effects don't work for me. Effect, like Google. Right? Uh, 
No, no, it's the headwear. Headwear. Yeah, I know. You're doing oh, there it is. It's slow. It's just really slow. Oh, don't kill the connection. Yeah, no, you're, you're lagging out, buddy. I am totally lagging out. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us this week. Uh, thanks for being here. Next week, don't forget, we're going to talk about SSK Corona. And Ed is going to give us an in-depth walkthrough of how that works and how you can use it to uh, make game development easier. All right? Uh, until then, have a great week, and happy coding. Arr, arr. <laughs>